Welcome to our IG Live series where I interview entrepreneurs, business owners, thought leaders, world changers. I bring to the community in an effort to provide the very best value and encouragement to the community here. Thank you so much to those who are joining in here this morning. We've got a treat for you here this week of Christmas. I wanna first start off, wish happy holidays to everybody, whatever holiday it is that you celebrate. If you celebrate, happy holidays to you. You know, my name is Josh Payne. I am a Silicon Valley entrepreneur, leader, mentor, 14 year veteran within the financial industry. And we are on a mission, ladies and gentlemen, to break down the systemic problems in our country of lack of equal access to the financial education and resources across all economic borders and ensuring financial literacy for all. And, uh, and, we're, and we're just so excited about where we're headed, about the, the year that's coming ahead and really just about continuing to add value to the community. Today's guest is a great friend of mine that's gonna be live from the UK, Ryan Nurse, has faced and overcome many adversities in life, and in doing so has gained vast amounts of life lessons and wisdom. Through adversity, he has found that our pain often will present our purpose and in his own life is now following his life's calling to use his own mess to create his message of inspiration and guidance to others seeking to become the very best versions of themselves possible. He's here today to share his lived experience in life and share how to extract the positives out of every, every one of life's curveballs. Ryan hopes to encourage you to take a long, hard look at your life and to really focus on what you want and to ensure that when you get to the end of life, you have no regrets. Folks, a survivor of a traumatic brain injury, Ryan is now a keynote speaker, life coach, and future best-selling author. This guy is one in a million, and I cannot wait for the community to be able to hear his story. He's gonna do an amazing job. I wanna welcome to the stage my good friend, the great Ryan Nurse. Let me just get him up here. There he is. Get him to the stage here. Let's let it rip. There he is, my Josh, man. Josh, I'm here, my friend. You? I'm so good. Can you hear me, Ryan? Can you see me okay? Perfect, my man. Great to see you, Ryan. Happy holidays, brother. I know you're over in the UK. What time is it and what day is it? Time is it over there in, in where you're at? Yeah, it's currently half past five in the evening, so p.m. here in, uh, I would say sunny England, but it's not. It's cold, wet and windy. <laughs> <laughs> as, as it so often is, I, I hear, man. Uh, so how are things going, man? Just got back from what? eight months over seven in... seven or just just over seven months in the end i calculated it you know so just over seven months traveling so wow. look, it's, it's good to be back you know but josh in all honesty my friend i really did leave my soul in colombia wow colombia is the one huh I, I mean all of it was good but i obviously i spent the last say before coming back the last sort of five and a half weeks in cali or in colombia in total the last few say uh, weeks in in Cali, uh, learning how to dance proper salsa, and I don't know. I just fell in love with it, and my heart, like I say, my heart and my soul is still there. So wow. I'm sure early next year I need to go back and collect it. <laughs> there you go, man. So you took seven months and you traveled all over South America. Tell me where you started, and then you ended up in in Colombia. Tell me how that journey looked. Yeah, of course. So yeah, I was sat there in the UK one day, and. I felt like I hadn't been really progressing. Although that I work on myself every single day, I felt like I'd almost flatlined a bit. And in life, if we're not growing, we're dying. And I thought I need to push myself really far outside of my comfort zone. 
So the plan was to either go back to Asia or go this way to sort of uh, Mexico. And I'd never been to Mexico before in my life. And I was, I was sort of procrastinating in all honesty, Josh. And I realized that I wasted, say, a whole morning or a whole half a day just thinking about it. I said, right, take action right now, Ryan. Do something about this. I went to my drawer. I pulled out my credit card. I booked a one-way flight to Mexico for the week after, the, for the very next week. And, yeah, I left with no real plans, no idea of what I'm going to do. I landed in Cancun. And then over sort of two and a half months in Mexico, made my way from the East Coast to the West Coast, all on bus. And then I flew back to the West Coast. And I made my way down through the whole of Central America. And I got to Panama. And then I took a sort of a pirate ship across to Colombia over five days. And I spent my last five and a bit weeks in Colombia. Oh, my God. <laughs> we talk about adversity. We're going to talk a lot about that today. Your, your, your life has been a story of overcoming, which I think is something that, that everybody needs to hear. I'm so excited to jump into it today. But you had adversity on that trip, like the first day you got there, and then several stories that we talked about as you were going through it, just of, of the different things that happened as you were traveling through the, the sort of this, these countries that you had no idea what you were going to Talk about a couple of those adversities that you hit and, and you know, just <laughs> some of your experiences in those travels. Yeah, so I could talk about them forever because I'm not joking, Josh. I've kept a list on my notes on my phone here and there's about three pages scrolling with your finger of, say, adversities or things that, say, really did happen. That Not all of them were really bad, but a few of them were almost sort of near-death experiences, in all honesty. Uh, could have been sort of fatal, you know. Um, but, yeah, after arriving to Cancun, maybe three hours of arriving in downtown Cancun, I was chased by a random guy. And I wrote a post about this the other day. He was sort of like a, a cross between a drug dealer and an undercover cop slash pimp. Like, I don't even know what this guy was, but he chased me. And then he come running after me. And I luckily, I went into a bar and I saw this guy run past the front door. That was after just being there for three hours. I did not tell my mum and she still doesn't know now. <laughs> um, <laughs> So yeah, that sort of set my trip off to like, what have I done? Like, in my mind, I thought everything was going to be okay, all excited. Straight away, I was like, what have I got myself into? I don't know where I am. I don't know what I'm doing. And this has just happened. Wow. Um, but then, yeah, over the next days and weeks, things sort of got better. Throughout the whole of the Mexico trip, yeah, there was some things. Um, but the main other two things that really did happen to me that was sort of the most memorable was one, I found myself taking an eight-hour chicken bus, the only <laughs> tourist on board, in the middle of the night to a place called Bluefields in Nicaragua. And I got there. I didn't know what I was doing, didn't know how to get to the place where I was staying. I was the only English-speaking person on board. And I sort of used my limited Spanish to ask a local young lady um, how to get to the place where I was going. And she just looked at it and she just shook her head and said, uh, she Google translates to me, do not go there, it's so dangerous. And then I end up getting a taxi there. The guy sort of locked the doors on me because he said it in Spanish, said it's too dangerous to go out. He took his silver chain off and hid it behind the dashboard on the car because it was that dangerous. And then this huge guy come up the side of the car and he was just staring in the glass window at us. Um, <laughs> that, that was that trip. And I took an eight hour... Chil children, don't do this at home, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so that was, a, that was one thing. And then the second thing, which was the most dangerous one, really, I rented a scooter of my friend, and she didn't know that I accidentally used a helmet that she didn't know about, which was in her house. I knew nothing about this. I ended up riding a scooter down into, say, a community where I shouldn't have really gone. And straight away, as soon as I rode in there, this guy just shouts in my face. I thought nothing of it. A couple of minutes later, as I'm riding around, this guy's just following me on a scooter. And then he starts trying to ramp me off. And then he chases me. I'm riding the wrong side of the road, up the banks and everything. He's, he's smashing me into the oncoming traffic, literally. My foot is just pouring out with blood. <laughs> and I'm like, what is going on? I thought this guy was going to shoot me. I luckily got into a petrol station. And this guy just Google translates and shoves it in my face. You stole my fucking helmet. And then he got two of his mates to come. And they were waiting around the corner for me. But luckily... 
nothing happened and we all sorted out in the end but yeah there wow. were some of the crazy things that happened man <laughs> talk to me about you couldn't be the same person when you came back as you were when you left it, through all of those experiences, what what do you feel like? How do you feel like you changed and grew through that seven month process of traveling through multiple countries, a different continent, someplace you didn't know where you were going to go? People telling you not to go somewhere uh, that you were supposed to go to. What was the change in in the person you were when you came back from that trip? Yeah, no, I love that. You know, so I can honestly say that a lot of the things that I sort of come back with were just re-emphasizing or, or re-ingraining those beliefs that I already had and the things that I already knew into my mind. So it's just strengthening the things that I already knew. Yeah, of course, I learned a lot of new things also. Um, but I went on this trip, say, when I first arrived in Mexico, I told myself on that flight on the way that everything that I've always ever done, I'm going to do the complete opposite. Because I'm one of these people that say before, before beforehand I'd go on a trip and I would plan everything to the pinpoint location. I'd know when, where I'm going, when I'm going, what time, what tour it's with, who I'm going to be with. And it was almost like over planning. Yeah, of course, failing to prepare is preparing to fail. But I said to myself, I'm going to leave everything open and I'm just going to take it as it comes. And I'm going to plan as I go, because that way I'm going to have more opportunities and more room for freedom and be say more malleable with my trip um not always did it work best you know sometimes i found myself walking around at midnight looking for a place to stay <laughs> which wasn't too great but you know i really learned that don't be so structured and solid with your plans in life be flexible because you can't always plan every single thing out to the exact thing, how you think it's going to go. Because we get in our minds sometimes, everything's going to go this way. And then soon as, say, we divert off that pathway that we created in our own mind, we get frustrated, we get upset, we get confused, we get stressed out. But just know that everything doesn't have to go one way. Life is not linear, you know. It's got to be flexible. You need to go this way. But then sometimes you go this way and sometimes you go back. You can't always be taking steps forward. So I really learned that, that just be more open when you're planning things in life. Mm. Um, but I learned that, say, especially with the adversity, you know, I made a quote a while back. And again, it's just really re-emphasized this. So the quote that I made says, adversity can quite often turn out to be a blessing in disguise. And from my own experience, I found that adversity is the prerequisite to growth, success, and true happiness. I believe hidden at the very core of adversity is the key to progress and lifelong happiness. It isn't going to be easy to find this key, but once you have obtained it, it will unlock the barrier to your next level of life. So adversity can be a gift if we choose to let it be. Mm -hmm. So all of those things, Josh, that I went through, all of those, say, being chased by people, being chased on motorbikes, lost, not being able to speak the language, being the only English tourist in one place at one time. I learned that you're going to find yourself in sticky situations in life at whatever time. But as long as you can keep cool and remain calm at all times, you will always win. Wow. Such a, uh, I can only imagine right? Just having, having no plan, flying out, and then just taking it as it comes and having these, these various situations. I think it leads such a great segue. And, and thanks to everybody who's joining us here today. We're speaking with Ryan Nurse live from the United Kingdom across the pond, a great friend of mine. And, and Ryan, you've got such an amazing story about adversity on such a, a more grand scale and i'd like you to take me back and share with the uh with the audience your story about your traumatic brain injury how that happened sort of walk us through the process of that and let's talk to to about kind of what we've learned from that you, your overcoming of depression and, and what's made you so successful 
at this point in your life to do things like you just talked about after such a major event in life. So take me back to that time. Yeah, of course, Josh, and thank you as well. Thank you for everybody that's listening to this. So before I start now, I'm just going to tell you that another quote of mine that I made, and it's so true in life, so I honestly believe that sometimes your most profound periods of pain can also turn out to be your greatest gifts of growth. So for me, back when I was 18 years old, I was an 18-year-old boy, and it was 2011. And as you do as an 18-year-old, you go out clubbing and partying with your friends. And me and some friends went to a local nightclub one night, and the music was pumping, the drinks were flowing, and we were dancing the night away. We were having literally the best time of our lives, but only until it was time to go home. So me and a couple of friends of mine, we made our way out into the car park and we got into a taxi. And as we started to leave the car park, we noticed that some older men had followed us out. And they stopped the taxi and they ended up removing us from the taxi. So after a short disagreement, we decided it would be wise to take another taxi to make it back to the safety of our parents' homes. So we actually left the car park, we turned left, and we turned left again onto a dark, unlit road. And straight away, Josh, we noticed that those same headlights from that vehicle that we'd just been extracted from was following us, and it was right up behind us, and it was tooting, it was flashing, and then suddenly our driver got a radio through onto his walkie-talkie, demanding that we pull over. So as the taxi started to slow down, we were sat in the back, we was confused, we were scared, and we was asking the driver, why are you stopping? What's the reason for you for stopping the car? But it was just silence. And he pulled up onto the curb, and he stopped the vehicle. And that same vehicle pulled up behind us and switched its lights off. And then there was just this eerie sound of silence. And we're nervous now, we're panicking. What happens next, we thought. And then suddenly there was this loud knock on the passenger front window where my friend was sat. So he opened the window to see what was going on. And as he did, he began to get punched through the window. So straight away, my friends jumped out the back and I opened my door to try and stop this madness. But as soon as I did, my door was ripped open and I was greeted with the same fist. I was sat there with my seatbelt on and I was sat there like a sitting duck. And this guy was just pummeling and punching me in the side of the temple. I couldn't undo my seatbelt because the belt had locked out. I thought, this is how I'm going to die. I was panicking. I was nervous. I was desperately trying to undo the buckle. And I couldn't. And there was just this repeated pain pummeling in the side of my head. It was, like a, it was like a machine gun. It was like a hammer to the side of my head. And I thought, that's it. That's me done. But thankfully, I managed to undo that buckle. And as soon as I released that buckle, the beating stopped. I made my way out of the driver's rear door and I run down the side road and I called a friend to come and pick us up. And as I wait there, my heavy head was just spinning. The pain was just throbbing. And then a short while later, my friend come and picked me up and he took me in the back of the car. And the whole way back, I remember my heavy head was just falling down. I couldn't keep my head up because it was so painful. And my friends were adamant that they were going to take me to hospital. But I told them, because I'd just been beaten up and I had a couple of drinks, it'll all be okay in the morning. And as we pulled up outside my parents' house, my friends were saying, please, let's just take you to hospital. And I said, no, I'll be fine. So the last thing that I remember, Josh, was walking up to the front door and putting my hand on that handle. And I walked through. And after that, I remember nothing. So now that I can only speak to you from my parents' point of view. 
So I walked into the bedroom and I took my clothes off. I folded them up as I usually done and I got into bed. And my mum was watching me like she done every time that us kids come back from a night out. She was watching me and monitoring me and she knew something was, wasn't right. Those maternal instincts told her something's not right with Ryan. So she went and told my dad. And my dad said, no, he's fine. He's just drunk. A short while later, I started to vomit. And it was this jet black vomit. And my mum was adamant something was wrong with me. And my dad being my dad just said, no, look, he's been drinking those black Zambuca shots. And he's just really drunk. He'll be fine in the morning. So my mum monitored me that whole morning. And I was making some strange noises. My little brother lay there in the bunk bed opposite. And he watched me just vomiting all night long. And then luckily for me, someone spoke to my brother that morning and said, is Ryan okay? Because he got beaten up. As soon as my brother got that information, he told my mum and dad and they rushed in to wake me up. But they failed to wake me up. And this was now around 10 o'clock the next morning. Bearing in mind the attack was probably four o'clock in the morning. So the paramedics were called and I was rushed to the hospital. I was rushed to the first hospital where they were trying to figure out what was wrong with me. And then they told my mum a short while later that I had to be rushed via air ambulance to a specialist hospital. But in the end, they just took me in the ambulance and my parents followed in pursuit. When I arrived to the specialist hospital, I went straight in for an emergency brain operation where I suffered from a fractured skull and a blood clot due to a bleed on the brain. I had to be put into an induced coma. And when my parents got to see me that evening, I was laying there in the intensive care unit in that coma. And the specialist who'd done the work on me said, due to Ryan's injuries, due to the severity of the injuries, it's highly unlikely that he's going to make it through the night. So we would really suggest that you go back and tell your loved ones. So my poor parents had to make that trip home that night and go and tell all of my friends and family that Ryan will not be here in the morning. But luckily for me, I was still being kept alive by that life support machine the next day. And three days in, I was still being kept alive by that machine. And then the specialist called my parents to the hospital. And as they sat down in that specialist waiting room, the doctor that had done the operation said, due to the severity of Ryan's injuries, and because there is zero brain activity, we would highly suggest that you pull the plug on his life support machine. So just imagine from any parent's point of view, what they must have been thinking and feeling at that point in time. But my dad done something that ultimately saved my life. My dad stood up and he said, no way. You don't know Ryan like I know Ryan. Ryan takes his own time to do anything. So you need to give him that time. And by them doing that, thankfully, it did save my life. A few days later, I started to improve on the, on the Glasgow Coma Scale, which it's called. And I started to improve. So I went from zero brain activity to start making, say, minimal movements. And then one day, my grandma was there and she leant down into my right ear. And she said, Ryan, open your eyes. And as I lay there, one eye just opened and stared at them. And they all cheered. They went and told the doctors and the doctors straight away dismissed everything. And they said, this is nothing. He's dead. This is all electrical impulses. But then a few days later, I did actually wake up out of that coma. And just before waking up, I was gifted an out of body experience where I honestly believe that I viewed myself through the eyes of someone or something else. Maybe my creator. But from what I saw in that out of body experience, I honestly believe that I've been sent back to this earth to finish the job that I was yet to complete. Wow. Such a, uh, an, a powerful story about that evening about overcoming, about love of, of the love of a parent to not give up, to know their children. And, and, and 
you woke up and 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 you, you you came out of the coma you improved but i know things were not easy for for you from that point on and i know there were bouts with you know struggling with depression for yourself and and things that that happened down the road through life and talk to me a little bit about that and and you know sort of how you overcame coming out of the coma and 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 the 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 mental mindset and then how you, you you struggled a little bit with depression and then how you overcame that and the importance of us understanding sort of the mental health side of things uh, as you had encountered so much trauma uh, as you were progressing. Talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, of course. So coming out of that uh, coma and say making the recovery. Yeah, Josh, it did take a long time, you know, like for me, the main things were like extreme memory loss, extreme fatigue. Like I couldn't stay awake half the time. I'd forget everything. I'd get frustrated at things. Um, yeah, it was just very difficult. And that lasted for years and years and years and I, on end, to be fair. But very soon after coming out of that, say, trauma or that traumatic event, I met, which is now my ex-partner, my ex-girlfriend. And we went into this fast-paced relationship and at the time, it was just exactly what I needed. It was total opposite to the life that I'd been living. So within about a year, we was moved out with each other. And then maybe one year after that, we decided to get a mortgage on a house. And we were living this, say, perceived perfect life that society tells us we need in order to be happy, in order to be successful, in order to be perfect. We had the cars, the house, the holidays. Everyone looking in from an outsider's point of view was saying, Ryan, how are you doing this? And in all honesty, I didn't even know how I was doing it half the time. I was just working, working, working. And then we'd come back and we'd work on our house. And then we'd go on holiday. And we thought we was living this amazing life, this great life. But now looking back from, say, a more mature set of eyes, this perfect life didn't exist. And it wasn't so perfect at all. And it felt four sometimes you know so I was with my ex-girlfriend for just over six years six and a half years and like I say we was going on holidays all around the globe every year we was working on the house constantly and then after our last holiday in 2018 so we decided to go on five trips abroad that was the most trips we'd ever go on in one year and we just got back from Florida. And as we arrived back at the end of November, a few days later, at the start of December, my girlfriend says to me, we should stop spending as much time with each other. So straight away, I was confused because we live with each other. We sleep in the same bed. Like, how do you stop spending as much time with someone that you go to work you come home and you spend all the time with each other and then you spend the weekends with each other. I couldn't, I couldn't figure it out. And then after that, Josh, things just began to take this spiral downhill and it just began to speed up, constantly speed up. And before you know it, we were sleeping in separate rooms and then it was Christmas and I ended up spending Christmas alone. And this was horrible. Waking up on Christmas day by yourself in a home alone. And then we had a trip booked to go to Cape Town backpacking with each other in March 2019. And she said to me that she didn't want to go anymore. So I plucked up the courage to go on this trip on my first ever solo travel because I'd never been abroad before meeting this person. Every time that I'd go on holiday was with this person and I'd never been abroad by myself. So it was petrifying to even think about going to Cape Town by myself but like I say I plucked up the courage to do it however only just a few days late before sorry only just a few days before leaving to Cape Town I walked into a restaurant and I bumped into the person who said that she wanted to be single sat there with another guy and seeing this shattered my heart into a million pieces but it was also this huge sense of liberation. Because all of those thoughts and feelings that had been going around in my mind for months 
were just confirmed. I knew everything that I thought was true. And I walked out of that restaurant. I took a deep breath in the cold, crisp air. And I felt on top of the world. And a few days later, I went to Cape Town. And on that trip for about two, two and a half weeks, I had the best time of my life. I felt like I could, I could accomplish anything. I felt like a new man. However, returning now to which was an empty home, I crumbled and I, sh I just broke down. Because I just realized at that point in time, it was just me. And that crippling sound of silence just made me bawl my eyes out. Because at that point in time, I hated the sound of silence and I hated my own company. But that was all I had from that moment on. So now going through 2019, I ended up going through many months of mental misery where every single day, it was just a deep depression. I was just going down and down and down. Every day was almost like Groundhog Day to the point where things just got worse and worse and worse because I was so deep down and desperate for this happiness, which I believe come elsewhere. I was searching every single place, but other than from within myself. Because I went for a stage of Googling how to be happy. Mm -hmm. Like Google mm -hmm. had all the answers to my life. Mm -hmm. Trust me when I say that happiness is homemade and it comes from within. You will never find happiness through anyone or anything, no materialistic thing. Because there's a huge difference between happiness and true happiness. Mm -hmm. Happiness might come from those things that we get in the moment and they don't usually last. It could be, say... A car, a person, a job, a home. But you could say, crash that car. That person that you thought brought you happiness could sadly die. You could say, lose the job and in return have to sell the home. Because those things that we think bring us happiness do not bring us happiness at all. True happiness comes from doing something on a daily basis that makes you move forward. And it comes from, say, just enjoying the things that you have in the moment. I say true happiness is not getting what you want, but it's wanting what you've already got. Wow. So I was on this search for happiness and it lasted, like I say, for months and months and months on end. Let me, let me ask you, let me, first of all, I just want to thank everybody who's joined us here today. I see my good friend, Renee, Thanks, buddy. Appreciate your comments. I think I even saw my pop jump in here to listen mm -hmm. to you, Ryan, which is, which is pretty awesome. Uh, but thank you to everybody. I know I saw Jennifer. I know I saw Nika. I saw Briley. Uh, just great to see everybody jumping in. Take me to that moment now. You're at the bottom of life. You're at the, mm -hmm. you're at, you're at the very bottom, man. You're, you're looking up at, at zero, right? You're in, you're in that negative space. What was that start of that turning moment that, that shifted? Because, you know, I think we're in a time right now where there's a lot of people that can probably identify with the emotions that you've shared, those feelings that you've shared, and are looking for that, that, uh, that, that resource to help move forward. So what was it for you, Ryan, that, that made that shift where you started moving forward, you started climbing back up, you started progressing back forward towards where you're at today? Mm, yeah, that's a, that's a great question, Josh. So I just want to start by saying that it is progress that equals happiness. Because if we're not growing, we're dying. Literally, we are dying. And for me, I was going downhill. So I did at one point have to take myself to the doctors because I felt like I was at rock bottom and I felt that there was no other way out. I was now sort of down deep and depressed and suicidal. But anyone that's listen, listening to this or who will listen to this, please believe me when I say that suicide is a permanent solution to a temporary problem. Because at that point in time, I felt like I was at rock bottom and I couldn't go any further down. And the only way out of this was suicide. And what got me out of that, Josh, you asked? One single thought. 
was the switch, was the turning point for me. One single thought. I was sat there one day and I was sort of half sat, half laying on the sofa. And this was the day that I was going to take my life. I was just crying my eyes out. And in my head, I was saying, go on, just do it, just do it. This side was saying, do it, do it, do it. This side was saying, no, because at that point in time, my biggest fear was death. But I managed to use my fear in my favour, because that fear of death saved me from doing something that my future self would have really regretted. So I knew exactly what I was going to do. But thankfully, the fear of death made me procrastinate from doing what would have been the end of my life. And as I'm sort of sat laying there, tears running down my face, one single thought come into my mind and it said to me, could I live with the thought of dying with regrets? I don't have a clue where this thought come from, but I just listened to it. And I was almost like, magnetized to this thought. I held on to it. And I just kept repeating it over and over again in my head. Could I live with the thought of dying with regrets? Because for months on end, I'd been sat there in this self pity party, feeling sorry for myself, Josh. And I hadn't done anything to try and get myself up and out of this ditch that I dug myself. So there and then I thought, you know what? I'm going to start to try and improve myself. What can I do right now in this moment to start to improve myself? To start making this way up the ladder to get out of this hole that I dug. So I started to just look around me. And I started to think back on that life that I'd overcome already. I started to look back at the brain injury. I was laying there with zero brain activity. They wanted to switch my machine off. They wanted to pull that plug on my life support machine. But you know what, Josh? Whilst in a coma, I wasn't conscious to decide whether to switch my life support machine off or not. And it was totally in somebody else's control. But I've noticed that many people who are alive and well have already unconsciously pulled the plug on their own life. Because death is not the greatest loss in life. The greatest loss is what dies inside us while we live. And the graveyard is one of the wealthiest places on this earth. Just imagine all of those undiscovered and unused talents, skills and abilities that cease to exist. All of those would haves, could haves and should haves that the world never had exposure to. And I personally don't want to perish filled with potential. So that one single thought made me say, what am I going to do with my life? I need to do something right in this moment to start progressing because I wasn't progressing. I was going downhill. Mm. And then I looked around at what I had around me and I started to practice gratitude. I didn't even know what the word gratitude meant at the time. And I realized that I had a roof over my head. I had food in my fridge. I had clothes on my back and I had shoes on my feet. And from that moment on, I just pulled out a pen and paper and I just wrote down every single thing that I'm thankful for in my life. And from that day on, Every morning and every night, I wrote down what I am thankful for today. Because I realised, Josh, that there's so many people out there that are living on that cold, hard concrete, wishing that they could have traded places with me. And there's me, upset, stressed out, complaining, sad. And I had all of this stuff around me, I had people around me that I wasn't even reaching out to because I thought that they wouldn't have a clue what's going on. I thought they wouldn't be able to help me at all. So I just kept it all bottled up inside. And that was the worst thing that I could have done. So I first started to practice gratitude. And then I second reached out and I started to share my feelings. I started to tell people how I'm really thinking, how I'm really feeling. And straight away, this huge pressure had just been lifted off of my shoulders. And then I started to progress. And by practicing this daily gratitude, I started to say, attract the positive things into my life. They were only small, but they compounded over time. Because I honestly believe, Josh, that gratitude is the gateway key to a life of abundance. And by practicing gratitude, before long, the house was sold, 
I was moved out. I was moving back to my parents. And that's when I started to say, go on this journey of self-discovery and self-improvement. Man, so powerful. Renee made a comment that that's a TED Talk story right there, <laughs> right? And I and, uh, appreciate that, Renee, your, your feedback on that. Thanks so much. And, and I agree. And that's why I wanted to get Ryan on here, because I, I just know that that connection is made through story. And, and you've got one of the most powerful stories. And, and I know it wasn't always easy, even when you decided that you were going to climb your way out, right? How did you continue to progress, right? I know Dr. Maltz talks about in Psycho-Cybernetics psycho that, that our creative mechanism is meant for progression. We are built for progression. That is the way, we're, that is the, way the human spirit and body is supposed to operate, right? And, and so when you say progress is happiness, I agree 100%. When, when, I, when I felt the worst of my life is when, is when I'm not doing the things it takes to progress towards the end result that, that we've set forth for ourselves. Now, I know not, not every day was easy, even though you understood that you start moving, you start practicing gratitude, doing all the things that, that it would take to, to progress towards the person you wanted to become, how did you continue to take those steps forward in the midst of, of adversity like you were going through? What was it that kept you moving forward? Yeah, that's a great question, Josh. So I think that there's a couple of things now, you know. So number one is by setting yourself goals. You need goals because if you don't have any goals in life, you've got nothing to head towards. You've got nothing to wake up in the morning, you know. But if you don't know where you're going in life, any road will get you there. You're going to drift around lost. Like we spoke about it so many times. You're going to drift through life not knowing where you're going. And you're going to get confused and stressed out again. So you need to have goals. And the way that I like to do goals is have one huge, big, audacious goal. And this goal is like the horizon. Like you may potentially never get there. Like the, fur the closer that you get to it, the further that it gets away. But that big, audacious goal keeps you waking up in the morning and it keeps you progressing and giving you something to push towards each day and then break it down with the smaller goals yearly quarterly monthly uh, weekly daily even hourly goals you know you need to have goals in your life just imagine watching a football game imagine watching say uh what's it the feet uh, the world cup that's just been on they had no goals no one would watch it because it'd be brilliant right. people would just be running around kicking the ball nowhere because they don't know what they're doing so you need to have goals to start with and then once you start progressing you get that feeling of improvement you start feeling good about yourself and it just it's a compound effect it makes you want to do it more and more and more so like i say for me when i would say lost my girlfriend losing my house i was going everything in my life was going downhill i was sad i kept it all bottled up inside but then when I come out of, say, that depression, I could see the light at the other side. I started to slowly come up the hill. And then I set myself a goal, a challenge, a target. I'm going to visit a different country every single month for a complete year. And I was happy. I was excited. I told everybody in my local village. I told everybody about it because I was progressing. I was moving up. I didn't tell people that, oh, yeah, I've just lost my girlfriend. I've lost my house, too. I told nobody about that. Because I knew I was going away every single month for a year, this challenge that I set myself, everybody knew about it. So then as I moved forward and progressed and kept challenging myself to push myself further, this feeling inside just gets so good. It gets so, it just builds. It's like this energy inside and it just makes you want to do more. And I made a quote again, and it's about suffering in life. And I believe that the true meaning of suffering is when your actions contradict your dreams and desires. So if you have a dream to say, like me, travel every month for a year, but then you're spending all your money going out partying every weekend, so you can't do it, you're contradicting your dreams and desires. So you feel like you're suffering. So you need to take action towards what it is that you want in life. And as soon as you take action, you're just going to get that feeling because action creates more action just as inaction creates more inaction because it's an object in motion that usually stays in motion. So once you get the ball rolling, 
it's going to be so easy to keep it going. Wow. Just to remind those who have just joined us, I see my boy Corey just jumped in. Great to see you, Corey. And uh, so happy that you, that you popped in here with Ryan, who's just got one of the most powerful stories you could ever hear. Uh, traumatic brain injury. Doctor said, basically, you know, get the troops around, get the family around because he's all but, but gone. And his dad said, no way. And, and, uh, and now you see him here today, right? He came back from that, came out of it. Everything was going well, went through a major change in his life, fell into a deep depression just back in 2019. And then you hear his story on how he climbed out and then just got back this year was seven months traveling from Mexico all the way down to South America on his own, no plans, no idea where he was going, the adversity he hit there, the overcoming, right? And, and just the, the, the character that that has built inside of you, you've got to feel like you can conquer the world after all of that, that nothing can stop you. And then to talk about the goals and the, and the vision and that we understand that we are in life, we are born to progress. We are not built to just stay stagnant. That does not happen. We are either progressing or we are dying. And so as we start to wind up here, I wanna know what is it in 2023 for Ryan that's got him fired up and, uh, and, and excited to hit the ground running each and every day. Yeah, no, thank you, Josh. And thank you, everybody, for coming on. So 2023 for me, like every year, every day I'm progressing. I'm moving forward every single day. So for me, I've got some big visions, big goals. Um, number one, I say I really want to make sure that I get one of my books completed and published because I've had a few books in the pipeline, on the go, uh, writing them. But I'm really focusing now on just getting one published and finished, completed, get it out there for 2023. Maybe two, who knows, but one is definitely going to get done. So hold me accountable for that one. Um, number two, I really did, you know, whilst traveling, I trusted that the path will be presented as I move forward with my travels, you know. And I believe that when I went on my travels, I'm going to find opportunities and as I was traveling, you know, Josh, that those whole seven months, I found many, many difficulties and challenges for solo travelers. And I experienced it myself, obviously. And I love community. I love helping people. I love making people's lives easier from the adversity that I face, whether it's through coaching, speaking, podcasting. And there's so many travel issues and problems that could be easily overcome. And I thought, you know what, 2023, I'm going to create a platform to help individuals as solo travellers to, say, experience less stress, struggle and suffering. And I'm going to create a community for solo travellers because so many people put off solo travel because of the fear of, say, getting robbed or, or being alone. So I want to pull all of that fear and, and worry out of people by creating a community and a platform to make it so much easier for people to find any information that they need and to then go on to have the best travel time. So I've just started a Telegram group to get this up and running. And then throughout 2023 and beyond, I've got some really big visions and goals for this as well. Fantastic. Fantastic. And, and from everything that, that, I've heard and, and certainly perspective from, uh, from, our, from others is perhaps there's a TED talk in there that you need to add to those goals to get this story out because Ryan, you, you're one in a million. And if you're not following Ryan, you've got to follow Ryan. Ryan, how do they follow you here on Instagram? Yeah, thanks again, Josh. So yeah, no, definitely. TED Talk's been in on my vision board since 2020. Um, so if anyone wants to follow me, the best place to follow me is here on Instagram. I'm, off, I'm over all social medias, but here on Instagram, at Ryan Nurse underscore. But if not, I'll be on any social media. You'll find me there somewhere. Yep, same handle, at Ryan Nurse underscore. It'll be in the comments to, the, to this, to this uh, uh, Instagram live as well. And, uh, and I just, you know, I just, 
want you to know how much I admire uh, the person you've become, the, the, the way you handle adversity, how you've grown. I know that's been a major journey. And, and just in a short amount of time, you know, 2019 to now and, and to see where you're at the top of your game, you know, how can people, if, if, if they wanted to reach out to you for podcasts, we got to get this story out there. So, so Ryan, any podcasts out there, Ryan is there, right? Anybody that, that needs a keynote speaker, he's amazing. Again, best way to reach you for podcast keynote speaking. If, if you're looking for somebody that, that can be a great coach to hold you accountable to your goals for 2023, what's the best way to do so? Yeah, again, just reach out to me here on uh, on Instagram, at Ryan Nurse underscore. It's the best way because I'm, I'm so active on Instagram. But yeah, I'm across all social medias. I have uh, my own email if anyone wants to reach out to me via email, which is info at ryannurse.com, info at ryannurse.com. But the best place is, like I say, Instagram, uh, LinkedIn, everything like that. But it's all social medias. You'll find me somewhere. Fantastic. Fantastic. How about one last parting message for anybody listening that could help them take and make 2023 the greatest year of their life? What would that be for you? Okay. Right. Bear with me. So we all set these New Year's resolutions, right? You set a New Year's resolution and whether it's going to the gym to get healthier, to eat healthier, to start the first business, to ask that person out, to, to go somewhere new, to travel around the world, whatever it is that you want to do, we set these little goals. Some of them last to the end of January, some of them don't. But what usually stops us? It's fear. It's wanting that instant gratification as well. Just know that in life, nothing that is worth having comes easy. It doesn't come in an instant. You need to put in the uncomfortable action on a daily basis. So whether you want to say, quit your job and start your own thing, whether you want to travel the world like I done, do not, and I repeat, do not let fear stop you. Because we've all heard fear stands for false evidence appearing real. I think it stands for freeze, evaluate, and reverse. Or focus, evolve, and relax. So do not let fear stop you from anything. And I say, flip fear for fortitude. You know, let fear be a motivator. Let it motivate you and use fear as fuel to help drive and propel you towards that future of fulfillment. Because... So many people are scared to go after what they want due to fear and failure. Don't fear failure in whatever you do. Fear regret. Make the pain of regret worse than any other pain that you could ever imagine. Because the pain of fear and failure is temporary. But the pain of regret will last a lifetime. So don't take your greatness to the grave. Wow. Let that one settle in for a minute. Don't take your greatness to the grave, man. Ryan, you're one in a million, man. And we've enjoyed our time with you here this morning. I know the, the community will be better because you spend some time with us here. I want to wish you and your family a happy holiday season the best during the new year. I can't wait to continue to watch you knock down those goals in 2023 and, and be a fan of yours and your successes here over this upcoming year. And just thank you for taking some time to spend with us here this morning, pour into the community. You can reach Ryan at Ryan nurse underscore, right? Any podcasts, any speaking events, this guy's story needs to be heard by the masses. It's so inspiring right? And again, if you're looking for that accountability, that coach to help you accomplish those goals in the new year in 2023, reach out to Ryan at Ryan Nurse underscore here on Instagram across all social channels or info at ryannurse.com. 
if you want to email him, right? It's been a pleasure, my friend. And I look forward to doing this again here soon. Josh, thank you so much, my friend. I really enjoyed it. And thank you for everybody that's listening and that will listen. I wish you all a Merry Christmas. And I look forward to catching up with you all soon. God bless, man. Go get them. Happy thank holidays. You, my friend. Happy New Year. Let's go do it big. Let's do it, my friend. Thank you. All right, brother. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.